Finance Committee will come to order. The Finance Committee meets this morning to discuss an important set of nominations that are instrumental to the federal government's finances. First will be the nomination of Marjorie Rawlinson to be Chief Counsel at the IRS. The Chief Counsel's <laughs> office is responsible for ensuring that the agency is implementing tax law by the books. It is difficult to overstate the importance of this responsibility, but we're very pleased that the President has sent the Finance Committee such a qualified nominee. Ms. Rawlinson has spent decades uh, in tax and management uh, fields in both the public and the private sector, including several years at the office of the Chief Counsel she'd been nominated to run. If confirmed, she would be the first woman to serve as Chief Counsel. As colleagues are aware, the IRS is waist deep in its work to issue guidance related to the Inflation Reduction Act. Having a confirmed Chief Counsel will ensure this work is carried out to the letter of the law. This is particularly important as this committee, for example, spent years and years, Ms. Rawlinson, working on the clean energy tax credits and the prescription drug issue in particular. Now, the Chief Counsel's Office also has an important role in the IRS's effort to move away from auditing low-income and middle-class Americans and towards complex pass-throughs and wealthy individuals. This goes right to the heart of reality in the tax code. Working Americans, mostly low- and middle-income, overwhelmingly comply with the law because their information is automatically passed on to the agency through payroll. On the other side of the coin are the complicated pass-throughs and other structures often designed by the wealthy, specially for tax avoidance. I expect any chief counsel to provide support for the agency's effort to put more attention on billion-dollar partnerships rather than low-income individuals <clears throat> and to ensure that legal strategy is sound, as I have little doubt that those who have made vast sums through tax avoidance schemes will be fighting this fresh approach with a legion, a huge number of lawyers and accountants. It's no secret, as you know, Ms. Rawlinson, that Democrats and Republicans have differing views about how the IRS should operate. The position of the chief counsel has historically been one that has received bipartisan support. And it's my hope that that will may remain true with Ms. Rawlinson's nomination. The last chief counsel, Michael Desmond, was reported out of the Finance Committee with a 26 to 2 vote and was confirmed by the Senate 84 to 15. I hope, colleagues, we can maintain this record of bipartisan support. Now on to the public trustees. The Board of Trustees of Social Security and Medicare is responsible for issuing annual reports to Congress on the status of the trust funds that ensure Americans receive their earned benefits now and into the future. The board is made up of six members, the Treasury Secretary, the Secretary of Labor, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and the Commissioner of Social Security, as well as two public trustees. The board has been without public trustees for over eight years. Unlike most nominations that come before us, the public trustees do not represent the views of the president or the agencies they will be managing. The public trustees represent the American people ensuring their voices and their views are represented in the annual reports that are done. The Finance Committee has long held the view that when the term of a public trustee expires, a new public trustee must be nominated to bring fresh views to the board. That's going to include insight on emerging trends in Medicare, like how to update and strengthen the Medicare guarantee, which has been a special priority of this committee. We were led by the late and I feel great, Senator Orrin Hatch, who <clears throat> led us in this transformation of Medicare away from acute illness only to dealing with cancer and diabetes and heart and stroke and all of the chronic illnesses. So these are the kinds of issues that the uh, group is going to uh, have to tackle, and seniors are counting on leadership in areas like uh, chronic care that has its roots in the bipartisan work in this committee, and I was honored to have worked with Senator Hatch on it. I'm glad to see we're going to have two new faces before the committee, although they need a little in the way of introduction. Tricia Newman is basically a household word for all of us who've been toiling on these issues, and for me it goes back to Great Panther days and 
She's been a household word on Medicare policy and finances. She's a longtime leader at the Kaiser Family Foundation. She worked in both the House and the Senate. And when Americans read articles, news articles about health care policy, there is a very high probability that Ms. Newman will have been interviewed for the article. Uh, Demetrius Kazukas has been nominated to fill the Republican slot for the public trustee. He's got extensive experience across our federal health programs, serving at both Health and Human Services and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, as well as a variety of roles in the uh, private sector. Both nominees, in my view, have the experience needed to represent the public and ensure the integrity of the board's reports. I'd like to emphasize that this role requires putting the public interest first, not the interests and values of your day job and other financial relationships. The financial future of both Social Security and Medicare are very much on the minds of families across the country as well as lawmakers. And what we will have to do is chart a course that will protect and strengthen America's earned benefits. So we thank the trustees for considering this role as that it's going to require a substantial amount of time, many dozens of hours of work each year and sweat equity to fulfill this public service. So I want to congratulate all three nominees, thank them for joining the committee today. I support all of these choices. And uh, after Senator Crapo makes his opening remarks, we've got a few routine questions that we ask nominees, and then we'll go forward with our uh, discussion. Senator Crapo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to our three nominees. Dr. Newman and Mr. Kazukas, who have been nominated to be the public trustees of Social Security and Medicare, and Ms. Rollinson, who has been nominated to be the IRS Chief Counsel. Thank you all for your willingness to serve. The trustees are responsible for producing annual reports that equip Congress and the administration with data needed to safeguard the long-term security and financial viability of the Social Security and Medicare Trust Funds. Congress added the public trustee positions in 1983 to increase public confidence in the integrity of the trust funds and objectivity of the trustees' reports. The public trustees are tasked with providing objective, dispassionate accounts of exactly what is happening in the trust funds. If confirmed, you must ensure the public has a balanced, pragmatic understanding of the opportunities and the challenges that face the two programs. And I look forward to hearing from both of you today. Ms. Rollinson, the IRS Chief Counsel, is responsible for fairly and impartially interpreting and enforcing our tax laws, while also ensuring taxpayer rights are strictly protected. Given recent IRS controversies and the push for it enhanced enforcement, Americans are rightly concerned with the potential erosion of their rights and privacy. The IRS Chief Counsel must have the highest level of skill, judgment, and integrity above all, and must not let political pressures affect policy outcomes. Unfortunately, the agencies to which you've been nominated for key posts have recently made repeated practice of putting politics first. My colleagues and I have raised a number of concerns with recent IRS and Treasury actions that will fall under your remit. Interpreting the so-called Inflation Reduction Act is squarely within the IRS Chief Counsel's purview. The IRA created complexity that has proven unworkable in implementation, putting many American businesses and consumers at a significant disadvantage and has supercharged IRS enforcement while shortchanging taxpayer service. Since the bill's rushed and strictly partisan passage, the Biden administration has resorted to unilaterally walking back and diluting a number of its own key provisions. The IRS has simply disregarded statutory deadlines for implementing new Democrat-led provisions, including enhanced information reporting and EV tax credits. Further, Treasury and the IRS's expansive interpretation of IRA's energy tax provisions has provoked significant criticism from both sides of the aisle. Other provisions have gone into effect without necessary guidance, leaving taxpayers without information needed to comply. I look forward to hearing how you will address these concerns and use your expertise to put adherence to the law over desired political outcomes. If confirmed, you will also have a significant role in addressing a number of other recent 
concerning IRS actions. Use of IRA funds to increase enforcement in areas with a long history of burdensome and low utility or no change audits. Leaks of confidential taxpayer information. Destruction of 30 million information returns, which reportedly led to additional audits of earned income tax credit claimants. And the ongoing attempt to stand up and divert resources to an IRS run tax preparation program without statutory authority. The administration's practice of putting politics before sound policy extends to its failure to protect U.S. interests in the OECD international tax negotiations. Rather than focus on fighting discriminatory taxes against U.S. companies and defending current U.S. law, Treasury has placed the administration's political agenda first without regard to the potential effect on U.S. taxpayers. This administration failed to halt discriminatory digital services taxes against U.S. companies, but instead invited foreign governments to pursue new discriminatory taxes against our companies in the form of the under-tax profits rule, a surtax which also violates our existing bilateral tax treaties. As a collateral consequence, Treasury must now exhaust precious resources issuing regulations to attempt to mitigate the double taxation it's created by unilaterally committing to a global tax deal that undermines U.S. interests. To avoid these outcomes, I stress the importance of engaging this committee with transparency and responsiveness. Too often in recent years, the administration's nominees have committed to working with us, but have failed to follow through. On behalf of all American taxpayers, I strongly urge our nominees here today to commit to timely and thorough communication with this committee. Again, I congratulate you on your nominations. And Ms. Rollinson, I know you weren't there when all the things I just described happened, but you're going there now probably. So I hope that, that uh, we can have a constructive conversation about how to deal with these issues during the hearing today and as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Senator Crapo. And I just want to say as we begin this uh, hearing, uh, certainly uh, we know that Democrats and Republicans have some differing views on a number of these tax issues. Senator Crapo and I always say we're going to work to try to find common ground wherever possible. And I appreciate, appreciate my colleague doing it. OK. Uh, we're going to introduce our first two nominees. Uh, I'll take care of that. And then we're going to have Senator Cardin introduce uh, our friend Ms. Newman. Uh, Ms. Rollinson has decades of tax and management experience in both the public and private sector, including several years at the office of the chief uh, counsel that she's been nominated to run. Uh, Demetrius Kazukas has been nominated to fill the Republican slot for the public uh, trustee position. He has extensive experience across our federal health programs, serving at both Health and Human Services and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, as well as a variety of roles in the private sector. Now I'm going to turn it over to Senator Cardin to introduce our final nominee. And he is a lucky fellow to do it, because we're <laughs> uh, all people who have worked closely with Ms. Newman over the years. Senator Cardin. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing that. Uh, you might ask, why am I asked to introduce Ms. Newman? She's a resident of the District of Columbia. But uh, Senator Van Hollen and I have sort of adopted the people of the district until we do the right thing and give them their own representatives here in the United States Senate. But there's another reason I ask uh, to introduce Ms. Newman. She has deep roots in Baltimore, in my state. It was her great Grand, great great grandfather uh, that started the highest tailoring company. And I mention that because Baltimore, if you go back about 100 years ago, uh, one of its leading uh, sectors was the garment and tailoring sector. Uh, it was a major part of our economy. And highest tailoring was a high end tailoring and uh, added to the, the richness of Baltimore and its history. So uh, for all those reasons, it's really my pleasure. And then the last reason I wanted to take this time, as the chairman pointed out, uh, Ms. Newman served on the Ways and Means Committee as staff for the Health Subcommittee. I had the honor of serving in the, on the Ways and Means Committee, the Health Subcommittee. I know personally of her dedication and experience and work here, and uh, we couldn't have a stronger candidate uh, nominee for this particular position. She also served on the Senate 
a staff committee on the aging. So she comes with broad, broad experience. And as you pointed out, uh, she, she is a nationally recognized Medicare expert with extensive knowledge on issues associated with coverage, affordability, spending, and financing care of older Americans and people with disabilities. Proposals to stay in Medicare for the future. Dr. Newman has testified before our committees on numerous occasions, and she's written extensively in this area. So we have a real expert. Uh, I'll just give you one last point. Uh, Senator Bennett asked that I acknowledge the fact that she went to the right undergraduate school, Wesleyan, the same school that Senator Bennett went to. Uh, for all those reasons, I would urge this committee to promptly confirm her nomination. Well said, Senator Carton. Let's um, have our nominees' opening statements, then we've got some procedural issues to take care of real quickly, and, uh, and I know uh, senators have questions. Let's begin uh, in terms of openers with you, Ms. Rawlinson. Thank you so much, Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, and members of the committee. I am honored to be here today as the nominee for Chief Counsel for the Internal Revenue Service. I want to thank the committee for considering my nomination and also the President for placing his confidence in me. I would not be here today without the support and encouragement of my entire family, most especially my husband, Harry, of 36 years, my daughters, Emma and Claire, and my mother. My mother, Barbara Rollinson, my daughter, Claire Oxford, my sister, Barbara Rollinson, and my sister, Amy Rubrell, are here with me today. They always inspire me to be and do my best. I grew up in the D.C. area, surrounded by dedicated public servants. From a young age, I learned the importance and dignity of hard work done well. My mother, who raised me and my three sisters, founded a nursery school. I was in her first class. She worked there until she retired almost 40 years later and helped hundreds of children during the most critical phase of their development. My husband, Harry, spent over half his career teaching in Virginia public schools, Knowing just how wonderful he is as a father, I can appreciate, appreciate the tremendous impact he had on the lives of his students. The example of my many friends and family in public service is what is calling me out of retirement today in hopes of becoming IRS chief counsel. This is a critical time for the IRS. The agency has lacked adequate resources for decades, but with increased funding, the IRS can develop into a world-class organization and promote a fairer tax system. The IRS also is at the forefront of implementing a substantial number of recent tax law changes. These efforts require tireless work from the Office of Chief Counsel, and I'm eager to lead those efforts. My tax technical experience and leadership experience from time in both private and public sectors have prepared me to help the IRS meet these challenges. I've spent most of my career at Ernst & Young where I had many wonderful mentors who taught me valuable lessons about leadership, collaboration, and serving with integrity. I also had the privilege of spending more than five years at the Office of Chief Counsel. There I saw employees who exhibited a deep commitment to integrity and a profound dedication to the mission. Treating taxpayers fairly was the core of everything Chief Counsel employees did and it would be the capstone of my career to serve alongside them again if I'm privileged enough to be confirmed. Throughout my career, I have learned that being a successful leader means drawing on the expertise of my staff, making sure everyone understands the mission, and always celebrating successes. I deeply enjoy technical tax work, but what I find most rewarding is motivating staff to produce exceptional results and reach their goals. I look forward to answering your questions, and if confirmed, to being a close partner to this committee and the Congress. Thank you. Very good. Ms. Newman. Thank you, Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, and members of this committee. I am honored to be here today to be considered for the public trustee position for the Medicare, Social Security, and Disability Insurance Trust Funds, along with my colleague, Demetrius Kazukas. I appreciate your taking the time for this hearing. I am deeply grateful to President Biden for nominating me to be considered for this important position. I am also so grateful for the support of my family, my friends, my colleagues, some of whom are here today, and especially my husband, Perry Pakros, my daughter, Julia, and my son, Ben. 
Social Security and Medicare are bedrock programs for our nation, providing health and economic security to tens of millions of Americans, mostly older adults, but also younger people with permanent disabilities, among others. These programs enjoy broad support among the general public because Americans understand the vital role that they play. It is difficult to imagine how families would manage without the financial protections provided by Social Security and Medicare. Clearly, Social Security and Medicare face financial challenges that will re require attention in the not-too-distant future. With an aging population, a declining worker-to-retiree ratio, and in the case of Medicare, rising health care costs, both the Social Security and Medicare hospital insurance trust funds are projected to have insufficient funds to fully cover obligated expenses by the end of the coming decade. Each year, the trustees issue a report on the financial status of these programs. The role of the public trustee is to assure the public of the integrity of the operations and sustainability of the trust funds and to help the public understand the fiscal challenges these programs face. The trustees work closely with the actuaries from the Department of Health and Human Services and the, and the Social Security Administration to be sure that the projections are based on sound assumptions, the right questions are being asked, and the presentation of findings is clear all while recognizing that modeling is by its very nature an inexact science. In some ways, I have prepared for this position for my entire professional life, working on issues related to health and retirement security for older Americans. My first job on Capitol Hill was on the staff of the Senate Special Committee on Aging, chaired by Senator John Hines, working right here in the Dirksen Building. I went on to be trained as a researcher at his, what, what is now called the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where I received a master's in health finance and a doctorate in health policy. I later served on the professional staff of the House Ways and Means Committee, the Subcommittee on Health, where the annual report of the Medicare trustees was a major focus of our work. Currently, I am a senior vice president, executive director of our program on Medicare policy, and senior advisor to the CEO at KFF, formerly known as the Kaiser Family Foundation. Our mission at KFF is to serve as a nonpartisan source of information for policymakers, the media, the health policy community, and the public. We do not take policy positions similar to the role of the public trustees. At KFF, I have conducted and directed research, written numerous papers, and spoken to a broad set of audiences about Medicare and related issues. I have examined options to strengthen the financial solvency of the trust fund. I have been a resource for policymakers and others in explaining the challenges facing Medicare and the implications for beneficiaries and program spending. Collectively, this work has provided the foundational knowledge and experience needed to carry out the responsibilities of a public trustee. I understand that the primary role of a public trustee is to assure the integrity and objectivity of the projections and that this is not a policy-making role. Relatedly, I understand that the data and the analysis and other information included in the reports are essential to the important work of policymakers. I believe I have the analytic skills required to fulfill this role and the communication skills to convey this information clearly. Since I was first nominated, I have been genuinely moved by the reactions of family members, friends, and colleagues of all ages all of whom thank me in advance for being willing to do my part as a public trustee if I am confirmed. They thank me mainly because they are counting on Medicare and Social Security to be in strong fiscal shape to support their health and financial security in retirement, and so am I. If I am confirmed for this position, I will work to the best of my ability to fulfill the responsibilities with rigor and integrity, and I would be honored to serve in this role and I look forward to your questions. Thank you Thank very you. much. I also remember those days working with Senator Hines, who you referred to, because he was hugely helpful as we closed one of the colossal ripoffs seniors faced with these Medigap policies, where they'd buy 10 or 15 policies that weren't worth the paper they were written on. So appreciate that history. Mr. Kazukas, welcome. Medicare.
thank President Biden for the honor of placing my nomination before the Senate and Senate Minority Leader McConnell for the trust he placed in me in putting my name forward for the position. I also thank Dr. Newman for her collegiality and professionalism as we have gone through this process of being considered together. And I am deeply grateful for the support of my family, friends, and colleagues, including those watching from home. We often hear and talk about how the Social Security and Medicare programs make up the largest portion of the federal budget and a substantial portion of our nation's gross domestic product. It is hard to overstate the fiscal, societal, and economic impact of these programs. And each of us can see the role the programs play in the lives of every American family, whether in paying taxes or as beneficiaries of the programs, now or in future generations. In our Constitution, the people vest Congress with the powers of taxation and spending that underlie these programs. Given their importance and size, it is imperative that Congress and the public have the most accurate and objective information possible about their status and funding. After all, as Abraham Lincoln is reputed to have said, let the people know the facts and the country will be saved. The work of the public trustees is essentially to help ascertain and publish these facts while being independent of administering the programs day to day. This includes witnessing the objectivity and integrity of the assumptions and calculations, as well as participating in the associated internal dialogue and deliberations. The result is enhanced public confidence in the trustees' work. For me, the opportunity to be considered for this role is meaningful and humbling, and it is that for reasons beyond these solemn goals or my professional journey. It is also personal. My first interactions with these programs were as a child of a parent with disabling and early chronic diseases. The challenge our immigrant parents had navigating the healthcare and retirement systems planted a powerful seed. That seed has grown and nourished the perspective that I have brought to my work throughout my career, especially as a public servant. Along the way, I have had the honor to work for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in several different capacities, including at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and from time to time, partnering with the Social Security Administration. I have also served as a member of the Administrative Conference of the United States, representing the public to provide advice to the federal government based on my experience in public administration and benefits programs. These roles built on others in the private sector and allowed me to develop knowledge and skills especially relevant to the work of the trustees. For example, early in my career, I worked at a nonprofit dedicated to improving public employee pension systems, including their intersection with Social Security. That provided me with a foundation in retirement policy and social insurance concepts, and it led to my work in healthcare as well. Later, as both a government lawyer and administrator, I developed a background in federal appropriations law and accounting processes. I have worked extensively with actuaries in the private and public sector, including the Office of the Actuary at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I was particularly honored to represent the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services at the meeting to issue the 2017 Medicare Trustees Report, where I served as secretary at the meeting and signed the report. Finally, as a government employee, I have testified before and worked with Congress on complex and technical topics like those addressed by the trustees. These collective and professional experiences, personal and professional experiences, afford me the knowledge, institutional memory, and judgment to represent the public in the work of the trustees. If confirmed, I would work to the best of my abilities to fulfill the expectations of the Greenspan Commission with regard to this important position. That is, to assure that the demographic and economic assumptions for the cost estimates of the future operations of the programs continue to be developed in an objective manner. Thank you very much for your consideration of my nomination. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. So we've got some obligatory questions that we have to go through with each of the nominees. And let me start first, and we'll have to hear from all of you. Is there anything that you're aware of in your background that might present a conflict of interest with the duties of the office to which you've been nominated? Ms. Rawlinson. No. 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 Second, do you know of any reason, personal or otherwise, <clears throat> that would in any way prevent you from fully and honorably discharging the responsibilities of the office to which you've been nominated? No. No. Third, do you agree without reservation to respond to any reasonable <clears throat> summons to appear and testify before any duly constituted committee of the Congress if you're confirmed? Yes. 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 Finally, do you commit to uh, provide a prompt response in writing to any questions addressed to you by any senators of this committee? Yes. 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 
Okay. Let's go to the questions. I'm going to start with you, Ms. Rawlinson, and talk about uh, the implications for the IRS if there is a government shutdown. Now, you were there at the agency during that time when the chief counsel's office was coming in and out of, you know, government uh, uh, shutdowns, and you're aware that uh, the IRS in these kinds of instances has to furlough existing staff. What I wanted to ask you, though, is what does the shutdown mean for millions of taxpayers? And I'm talking about small businesses. I'm talking about veterans. I'm talking about seniors. The millions and millions of typical taxpayers who can't get their questions answered, their returns and refunds processed, the kind of information they need to uh, address their hopes and plans for their future. And put it in the context, you know, so much of what goes on around here, and Senator Crapo and I talk about this, the government, you know, talks about all kinds of technical lingo. I don't want to do that with this question. I want you to take your best and most experienced take. What's this going to mean <clears throat> for the small businesses and the veterans and the seniors if the government shuts down? Thank you so much. I, uh, I think your staff was particularly alarmed when I told them that I started during a government shutdown and then left when there was a government shutdown. So I have been there for two government shutdowns in the, in the past. And I will say that um, from the perspective of the chief counsel, it is, it is concerning in terms of making sure that we're going to be staffed. But your question about looking at it from the taxpayers is one that I've seen played out uh, today in many of the news reports, people debating just, just how big of an impact is it on people right away when the government shuts down. And I think that is something that needs to be considered very carefully. From the perspective of the Office of Chief Counsel, it means uh, making tough decisions about what work will get done while the government is shut Free, down. Freeze frame that. So as counsel, mm -hmm. you're facing questions of will we be able to do this for veterans or that for seniors and maybe we have to put it off or something like that? Is that the kind of uh, choice that you saw people having to make? Thank you. What when I was there, uh, the, the workers were divided between essential and non-essential. I think they've gotten rid of that title because it was just a little bit offensive to the people who were told they were non-essential. Um, but yes, choices have to be made about what work can get done while the government is shut down. And it can have an impact on ongoing litigation. It can have an impact on um, <clears throat> guidance to the, to the field. It can have a very direct impact. And I just want to make sure that when you talk about litigation and, and impact, you're telling us that coming in and out of government and going, going through that, this is not some abstract issue. This is something that's real for the millions of typical taxpayers. We're still apparently wait, awaiting more guidance from the government, but based on everything I've heard and you've been through them, this is real for those millions of people. You know, the taxpayers in my state are basically 3,000 miles away from Washington, D.C. And for them, Washington, D.C. most of the time might as well be Mars for the impact it has on them. But I think what I've heard from you in the past and, you know, others is that for those seniors, those veterans, those small businesses, this isn't an abstract issue. This can really uh, have a damaging effect on their lives and their future. Is that correct? Yeah, I think you raised a okay. very good point. Very good. Ms. Newman, just a question for you, and my colleagues remember this, and uh, we're so thrilled working with Chairman Hatch because I went to the chairman, and I said, you know, when I was coming up as director of the Gray Panthers, Medicare had Part A and Part B. Part A was hospitals, if you broke your ankle, I went to school on a basketball scholarship, saw a lot of those. <laughs> um, people who are still recovering from you know, injuries that they sustained when they were young. And uh, 
And then part B was for the doctors. He had a horrible case of the flu. So the three of us working with you know, Chairman Hatch and a lot of colleagues over here, Senator, Carner, Senator Cardin, Senator Warner, we said the future of Medicare is going to be the millions of seniors who have two or more chronic conditions. You know, maybe they have cancer, diabetes, heart, these kinds of things. So we wrote a major bill that I think is really transformative. And I'd be interested in your uh, thoughts about the impact and how your work will be affected from these kinds of emerging trends in American healthcare. You know, obviously can't get into a specific bill or that, but what I can tell you is the Medicare program of today is not the Medicare program when I was coming up as director of the Great Panthers. So how do you factor in these emerging trends? Thank you for that question, Senator. I'm glad you're bringing, you have brought so much attention to the issue of an aging population with people with more chronic conditions, living longer with more chronic conditions, and the importance of doing something to better manage care for people as they grow older. This is an important issue. It's an important issue for, for Medicare. It's an important issue for medical care. I think any one of us who may have family members with diabetes or hypertension or cancer, heart disease, understand just how important it is to better manage care, work across specialties so that people get the best possible care and that certain conditions are prevented, um, also an important factor. As a public trustee, I think the focus would be um, somewhat narrower. I think on the one hand, a public trustee would look at the extent to which chronic conditions drive spending and affect spending. And on the flip side, I think a public trustee would want to look at the effect of any interventions or policy changes or regulations that may actually <clears throat> slow the growth in Medicare spending. My, my, my time's expired. We're going to have some suggestions because I know, for example, I've been talking to my colleagues and you know professionals in the field. If there were grab bars, for example, for elderly folks, that could prevent a lot of incredibly harmful falls which devastate lives and cost enormous sums of money. Those are the kinds of things we're going to want to talk to you about. Uh, Senator Crapo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my first question is for both Ms. Newman and Mr. Kazukas. Uh, as public trustees, you would be entrusted with providing an unbiased and independent review of financial status of the trust funds. Maintaining the credibility of the reports submitted to Congress is vital. Their analysis and underlying economic assumptions are used extensively by public and private entities to evaluate not only the programs themselves, but also overall government spending. These reports do not include policy recommendations, nor do they advise on policy. The public trustee positions do not provide platforms for anyone on either side of the ideological spectrum to espouse their personal policy viewpoints. They are tasked, quite simply, to provide objective, dispassionate accounts of exactly what is happening with the trust funds. Dr. Newman and Mr. Kazukas, will you commit to maintaining an independent, nonpartisan, and objective oversight role, if confirmed? Yes. Yes. Thank you. I'd like to go now to uh, Ms. Rollinson. Uh, as we talked in my office, uh, one of the troubling concerns that I've seen is a recent trend that, there, I, from my perspective, is a willingness of the IRS and Treasury to ignore the plain language in enacted statutes when issuing regulatory guidance. For example, in the case of the IRA's new EV tax credit, the IRS and Treasury proposed rules that had no statutory basis and simply ignored the statutory deadline for issuing guidance, which had the effect of temporarily preventing new requirements from taking effect and allowing scores of credits to be claimed inappropriately. There are other recent instances where the IRS and Treasury have ignored unambiguously stated effective dates and delayed certain provisions from taking effect. As I said earlier, I know that you were not in the government at the time these actions were taken, 
But do you believe that it is proper for the IRS to issue guidance that is clearly inconsistent with statute? Thank you for raising this. I, I was going to just say no, but I will, <laughs> I'll elaborate. Um, I, uh, the Chief Counsel Office is very important in terms of making sure that the laws passed by Congress are interpreted fairly and that guidance is issued quickly. That's how we cut down on disputes. That's how we make sure that the benefits that Congress is intending people to get are, in fact, available. And so, um, although I don't, don't know um, fully the the exact regulations that you're talking about, it would be, if I'm lucky enough to be confirmed, it would be a big priority of mine to make sure that the Office of Chief Counsel is advising fully on what we think the proper interpretation of the law is. Well, thank you. Then, if confirmed, how will you approach, and I think you've answered this, but I'd like you to answer it again. If confirmed, how will you approach a situation where the statute is clear, but the administration seeks a different outcome? whether based on claims of administrative complexity or political expediency? That's, that's a very important question. What, what's interesting is how often tax law is not that clear. But to the extent Understood. if, if uh, I, I agree with you that to the extent the tax law is clear, that we need to stay within the parameters of the law. And I also, and this was my experience when I was there before and would anticipate it being my experience if I'm lucky enough to be confirmed, I do think there are healthy debates among lawyers as to what, what words mean. But again, the Office of Chief Counsel's role would be to advocate for what we think the law says. And as a side matter, not a side matter, but equally important, making sure that the rules that are passed are administrable. And that would be my focus if I'm lucky enough to be confirmed. Well, thank you. Uh, very quickly, one last question before my time runs out. I'm also very concerned about specific instances where the IRS unilaterally, act, unilaterally acts without statutory authority, where there is no language to be clearer or unclear about. Pursuant to the administration's directive, for example, the IRS has recently begun building a program to prepare tax returns and give tax advice, allowing the IRS to act as tax collector, tax enforcer, and tax preparer. That puts them at the center of each stage of the process. And even though it was jettisoned from the partisan IRA, many of us worry that the IRS will move unilaterally into requiring systematic and deeply intrusive reporting on Americans' bank accounts without statutory authorization. My question is, do you believe the IRS has the legal authority to prepare tax returns or to track deeply in Americans' bank accounts without congressional authorization? Thank you. you. You're raising what I think are two separate issues. I'll address th them separately. One is the what I believe you're talking about is direct file. And the chief counsel certainly wouldn't be making a policy call as to whether it's a good idea to have direct file, but would absolutely be um, engaged in answering the question of whether we thought there was authority. And so I, if I am confirmed, I look forward to understanding what the thinking was um, as the IRS came to the conclusion that they believe they have the authority, since I understand they are moving forward with a pilot program. All right, thank you. I see my time's way over expired. I, I thank my colleague, Senator Grassley. No. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make an editorial comment before I start my questioning. It's in regard to your third obligatory question you asked these folks. They each answered yes, that they'd be glad to respond to all of our communications and everything, and uh, I don't question their sincerity on doing that, but whether you have a Republican or Democrat president, i found over the years that it's very, very difficult to have that completely fulfilled by the people that always say yes. So I just uh, say a more honest answer would be maybe. And, and I, I would only say, Mr. Uh, Mr. Grassley, you and I have teamed up on these things, and we ask tough questions no matter whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, and we're going to continue to do so. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Hey, I'm going to ask, uh, start out with Ms. Rollinson, and uh, I want to make clear that uh, I've got questions about whistleblowers, but there's two different whistleblower issues in the administration, <laughs> or even in Republican administrations. Uh, one deals with the IRS whistleblower program for saying that corporations don't pay 
didn't pay a certain amount of taxes. Um, that uh, legislation's brought in $6 billion, so I see it as a very worthwhile program. Uh, the second issue with whistleblowers kind of deals with government whistleblowers within. So I'm going to start out with the $6 billion program. Uh, obviously, you know, or maybe you don't know, but I've been a strong advocate for this program, uh, being involved in, with its enactment as well. I've heard concerns from stakeholders that the chief counsel's office is often a barrier to processing claims, especially in matters that have gone to the tax court. I'm concerned that there is an attitude in the chief counsel's office, obviously prior to your going there, that whistleblowers are a threat to the public fisc. Uh, the exact opposite is true, as I think the $6 billion figure proves. Whistleblowers are an asset that can help the IRS identify track sheets and collect additional revenues. If confirmed, would you pledge, uh, or do you pledge, to view whistleblowers as working with the IRS and work to uh, process cases quickly and fairly? Thank you, Senator. I, I am aware of your interest in this issue, and I, and I share it. I think whistleblowers are very important in terms of, of tax administration, and I really respect the role that they play. The Office of Chief Counsel should be something quite the opposite of a barrier because our role is to advise on, on how to interpret the law. So we should be working directly with understanding the claims that the whistleblower has brought forward, make sure that, we, that the law is being applied correctly, and helping dispatch the case as quickly as possible. Okay. One additional concern in this area I've heard from whistleblowers is that the chief counsel's office of, often undermines the whistleblower office by improperly asserting itself into the award determination. Uh, this is how much the whistleblowers should get for this information. If confirmed, do you pledge to support the role and decisions made by the whistleblower office and not undermine its mission by imposing additional burdens on that office? Thank you. If, if confirmed, I would look uh, forward to working closely with that office and, and certainly with the goal of not undermining their authority. Okay. Um, then this goes to the internal whistleblowers. If confirmed, you'll be the chief legal advisor to the IRS commissioner. Uh, as you probably know, I take whistleblower laws and protecting them very seriously. And we've had some IRS whistleblowers go publicly recently, and they haven't been treated as they should have been. I want a commitment from you that you'll support whistleblower rights and protections, and that you'll take steps to protect all IRS whistleblowers who come forward from retaliation, even including those involved in the Hunter Biden investigation. Yes, I agree. It's a very, a very different issue, the internal whistleblower, and I, again, think it's very important. Personally, I, I hope that if I'm confirmed, I run an office where I am, am open to criticism, that everyone in the office is open to criticism, that we take it seriously. And if it ever goes so far as to be a whistleblower case, it's very important that the whistleblowers be treated with respect and that there not be retaliation. Okay, and then for the trustees, Medicare, um, the 2023 Medicare trustee report says, quote, this year's determination triggers a Medicare funding warning, end of quote. The Medicare trustees have issued this warning over seven consecutive years. After this determination is made, the president is required to submit proposed legislation to Congress, and Congress is supposed to consider legislation on an expedited basis. Well, quite obviously, to date, no action has been taken throughout these years. Do you agree with this funding warning and that Congress should take this warning seriously?
it's something that uh, really goes to the heart of the trustee's role, which is to uh, provide the facts and the data to the Congress and the American public about the importance, uh, about the fiscal status and future of the programs. And uh, there's a, a role there for the public trustees and, and the other trustees to uh, highlight that message. And uh, the, the Medicare warning uh, is one uh, way that the Congress has an opportunity to follow up on the work of the trustees. And I look forward to collaborating with this body and the rest of Congress, uh, if, if confirmed, to uh, provide whatever information and other data might be helpful in Congress's role following up on those warnings. Senator Grassley, let me just close uh, on uh, this point. Uh, for a number of years, I've been your co-chair of the Whistleblower Caucus, and I just want to, I just, and I, you still are. and I thank you, and I look forward to continuing our work. Yeah. Senator Whitehouse. Thanks, uh, Chairman. I join you in uh, commending Chairman Grassley's long uh, support for uh, whistleblowers and transparency. Um, Ms. Rollinson, you are uh, headed over to the IRS to be chief counsel if you are confirmed. Um, you're not there now, as I understand it. That is correct. So um, this is just uh, something for you to consider when you get over there, if you don't mind hearing me out here. Um, the Supreme Court rendered a decision, at least a majority of it did, called Citizens United. I'm sure you're aware of that decision. Citizens United reflects the proposition that the Supreme Court eight to one endorsed that spending anonymous money in politics is corrupting. So pretty solid message. In fact, they said the only reason that we're letting unlimited money pour into politics is because it will be transparent. That's the guard against corruption. So the premise is anonymous money in politics, what we would call dark money, is corrupting, point one. Point two, we now have $2.6 billion in dark money spent in elections and more to come. So $2.6 billion spent in, on its face, corrupting dark money. So that's kind of a problem for American democracy. The device for a lot of this dark money corrupting spending is 501c3 and 501c4 organizations and abuse of 501c3 and 501c4 organizations. And I'll flag some of the abuses for you. One is to take a 501c3 and a 501c4 organization that are basically twins. Same location, same board, same staff. A corporate veil between them that you could pierce with a banana. And with that, a 501c3 that's supposed to do no politics can get enmeshed with what a 501c4 is allowed to do in politics. Policing the boundary between the 501c3 and 501c4, zero effort that I've ever been able to see by the IRS. Literally zero effort to even ask or to look and say, what's up here? These two really don't look that different as organizations. How are you reflecting the legal difference between 501c3s and 501c4s? Here's another one. You set up a little flotilla of re related 501c4s. So when the donor gives a million dollars, the first 501c4 spends half of it on politics and sends the other half to the second related entity in the cycle, which spends 250,000 of the 500 on politics and sends the other 250 to the next one in the cycle, which spends 125 of the 250 on politics and so forth. And so in a meeting room the size of that table, you could take a million dollar contribution and put 90% of it immediately into politics, particularly if it all ends up going to the same super PAC, for instance, and being reassembled on the other end of this sham operation. Zero inquiry into 501c4 cycling and the sham uh, operation. Um, and then finally, misreporting. 
The IRS receives reports from these organizations that say to the IRS, under oath, we don't spend any money on politics. And over and over again, those same organizations have reported to the Federal Election Commission and other election commissions, oh, we spent $17 million on political ads. The discrepancy between those two sworn statements, never investigated. And I strongly suspect that the battering that the IRS has received by dark money funded front groups and dark money funded politicians, which included attempts to impeach an IRS commissioner, attempts to refer to DOJ IRS staff, have cowed and intimidated the IRS so badly that it's not even trying to do its job. And by the way, no kudos to DOJ on this. DOJ still ref insists on an IRS referral even if it's a simple false statements case, which is bread and butter DOJ work. So between the DOJ and the IRS, neither side is doing its job, and there is a waist-high pile of baseballs that have piled up between shortstop and second base of neither side doing its job to defend us from what is, by law, corrupting political spending. Please. I will follow up with you after your confirmation, but you can't just chicken out on doing the job, and I hope you'll bring a spirit of uh, integrity there. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Senator Langford is next. Well, Chairman, thank you. Thank you to all of our nominees. It's not a fun process to go through uh, all of the questioning and all the prep and everything else that goes into this, so I appreciate all the work uh, that you've already done going through this process and to be able to get to this point on this. I do want to be able to uh, have a conversation uh, for our IRS future counsel here uh, to be able to talk through just the issues here. It's a pretty straightforward question. The IRS rules, do they carry the force and effect of law? For IRS rules, do they carry the force and effect of law? Thank you. Um, the, the IRS has the opportunity to, with Treasury, issue regulations on um, legislation that is passed by Congress, and they, those regulations are, in fact, uh, treated as the interpretation of the law. Right. Which, by the way, I'd agree with. Obviously, they're carrying that out. Most Americans would also receive that as well. The challenge has been of late is that uh, in the past couple of years, uh, Treasury has said that the IRS, when it goes through all its rulemaking process and actually put its regulations out, is not accountable to OIRA, to the Office of Information Regulatory Affairs, that other agencies have to get their guidance checked, but Treasury is saying the IRS does not. Uh, that we are going to be exempt from that process and we can make rules without the oversight of OIRA. Should OIRA be involved in actually that oversight process or can Treasury and IRS make rules outside of the Administrative Procedures Act? You, you raise a really important point that actually was, when I was there at Chief Counsel the last time, had just started percolating because okay. In fact, for a long time, the rules didn't go through OIRA. Right. I do think there has been a, a, a change, especially given some of the court cases that have come out, in terms of what has to happen in order for the regulations to be considered to be have met the APA and be compliant. And I, um, when I left the Office of Chief Counsel last time, our regulations were going through OIRA. So one thing that will be interesting, if I'm confirmed, is to understand where we are in that process. Yeah, it was about 97 rules, as I recount, uh, went through OIRA oversight during that time period where they were getting oversight. It seemed to flow. The initial concern was, well, this is going to slow the process down. Treasury, IRS, OIRA were able to work out a time period to be able to make sure that all this had guidance. OIRA's design is to be able to make sure we don't end up in a bunch of lawsuits. We don't end up in legal challenges. We actually save the taxpayer money and time. Uh, because it's actually gone through an internal review. It's interesting to me to be able to say with all that's going on right now with IRS and with so many new regs that are coming online that suddenly those don't apply to oversight. We can then look at the statute, apply it ourselves, and no one should look over our shoulder. I just don't agree on that. Um, what will be interesting is you're going to have some, some conversation on that. Obviously, as the council, you'll be in the middle of it saying, 
does this actually apply to us or is IRS completely separate from the Administrative Procedures Act? Can we make up rules without it? How will you go about trying to be able to make that decision? I'm not gonna put you on the spot on that to make that decision right now, but you're gonna have to put a process in place to be able to make recommendations to the administration should we be independent. Yeah. Thank you. I, I actually think it's one of the most important roles of chief counsel is to help ensure that regulations are considered are found valid if and when challenged. They're gonna be challenged a lot of the time. Right. Taxpayers deserve to understand the, the guidance comes out, that the guidance is gonna to apply to them. It is always concerning if people follow the guidance and then 10 years later it's found not valid and people have been following it for years. So I will be uh, very interested in making sure that the Office of Chief Counsel does everything it can to make sure our regulations are found valid. Okay, that'd be helpful. I, I think being a participant in the Administrative Procedures Act is not onerous. Every other agency does this, and it actually helps the taxpayer uh, in the long term to be able to know that there's another set of eyes to be able to look at this. I know I'm running short of time, but uh, churches, faith-based entities for years have a long-term struggle with the IRS in trying to determine when is it that they're talking about a moral, cultural issue, and when does that actually get into a political issue? What is their level of free speech? as a nonprofit and as a faith-based entity, they have had all kinds of challenges, letters. Uh, I know pastors that have made a tape of a message where they talked about an issue, sent it in the IRS and says, does this cross a line, give us clarity on this, and have never been able to get clarity from IRS on that. And th th there seems to be this sort of Damocles that hangs over them all the time, waiting for some judgment, some rule to be able to come down. It's an issue that does need to be resolved, that faith-based entities also know that they maintain their free speech the same as everyone else does. But so far, IRS has been unwilling to be able to make that statement publicly that faith-based entities do not sacrifice their First Amendment rights as well. So any help and any guidance on that in the days ahead would be very helpful to faith-based entities all over the country. I agree, thank you. Thank you. I thank uh, my colleague, uh, Senator Carper is next. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. Chairman. I had a chance to uh, welcome you all personally and I would do that in front of this uh, mass of people. Before I do that, I, I want to say something. There's a fellow sitting over my right shoulder. His name is Evan Giesman. Uh, we're only as good as the people that are on our staffs. And as you know, uh, help uh, uh, help us understand some of the issues. It's more than any one person could probably do. But Evan has been with us for about 400 years. He says it seems that long, but he's actually not uh, done it here nearly that long. But he's really done great work uh, with respect to major legislation, including the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, all kinds of trade legislation, and uh, I, we're going to miss him. And I want to say publicly in front of, in front of him uh, and all of you how, how much we value his his service. Um, yeah, having said that, I, I want to ask a question if I could of Ms. Rollinson, and uh, I. Uh, I've, I've been a long time outspoken advocate for fully funding the IRS. I've sat here, I can't tell you how many times, with uh, commissioners of the IRS, candidates or nominees for commission of the IRS, we ask them what can we do to be helpful as a, as a legislative branch. Almost everybody says we need uh, funding. We need to be able to fund the, the people who work at the IRS to do the work that, that needs to be done and make sure everyone's paying their fair share. Uh, I'm proud of the work that we did in the Inflation Reduction Act, which my staff and I had uh, played, a, I think, an important role and uh, in providing some badly needed funding for the agency. And I'm encouraged that those investments are paying off. Uh, one of the most important measures of the success of the IRS is agency uh, responsiveness to everyday taxpayers seeking uh, assistance. We actually monitor in my office, and we've done this for, I've been in the Senate for 22 years, we actually measure every month uh, our constituent services and, and what are people contacting us about, what issues are they raising, and one of the top issues forever has been uh, uh, the IRS. And uh, the, the issue is responsiveness of, uh, to, to the IRS. I, uh, I th uh, I, I think I have the right number here, but in terms, when, when I asked my staff to find out, uh, in terms of answering phone calls, the IRS answering phone calls, uh, 
During the uh, 2023 filing system, I'm told about 87% of the phone calls were answered by the IRS. Actually, somebody picked up the phone at the IRS, talked to a, uh, a constituent. Uh, I like, I have a friend, you ask him how he's doing, he says, compared to what? Well, compared to before the, uh, uh, the uh, 2023, I think we're looking at numbers, not of 87% of calls answered, but about 15% of calls answered. I think that's almost criminal for the people that we're supposed to be uh, to be serving. Um, and now, it's a lot better. It's not perfect, but it's one heck of a lot better. Question, Ms. Rollinson, if confirmed to be chief counsel at the IRS, how will you help provide clarity and certainty to taxpayers, not just personal taxpayers, individual taxpayers, but business community, nonprofits, and so forth? And uh, uh, how can we better uh, provide clarity and certainty to those taxpayers to assist, uh, seeking assistance and help ensure best in class customer service from the agency. Thank you, and thank you for the support you've given to the IRS. I, I, I've read about it. It's very impressive. I, I think that what the Office of Chief Counsel can do is to help provide timely guidance, timely guidance so people understand their obligations. I, I am thrilled to see that this year customer service has increased dramatically at the IRS. What, again, in the Office of Chief Counsel, we can make guidance publicly available so people can file their taxes, and we can promptly assist the IRS as questions arise, and that would be a very, very important role. Good. Second question, if, uh, if I could. Uh, I've mentioned uh, how the importance of our workforce, but one of the most important uh, tools for success in any organization, including the IRS, is the strength of its workforce. And unfortunately, during 2010s, the IRS budget was depleted and the agency lost more than I'm told 20,000 full-time employees, leading to an overwhelming backlog that we've talked about, poor customer service and really low morale among IRS workers. It, under the leadership of Commissioner Werfel, who I was privileged to uh, introduce and actually to recommend to the president to, to nominate for the leadership post of the uh, the, uh, the IRS. Uh, the agency has taken steps to support its employees and rebuild its workforce, but there's more work to do. Ms. Uh, Rollinson, if confirmed, how will you work with the other leaders at the IRS to support and empower uh, the agency's workforce? Yeah. I, I have to say, uh, one of the reasons I really am most excited about the possibility of going back is I think the people that work there are, are unbelievably dedicated to the mission and do a great job. And I would love to be part of recruiting in more people so that the staffing can be at a level that gives the American people the tax service they deserve. Mr. Chairman, uh, when you and I were uh, members of the House of Representatives, uh, I, I used to hold uh, town hall meetings uh, a lot. I'm sure you did too. And uh, we do every two years, we do a town hall meeting. We invite the IRS, we invite the Delaware Division of Revenue to come and help people to actually do tax returns. And uh, I remember once, and we do a, uh, we do a, a uh, exercise trying to balance the budget, let the people in the, in the town hall meeting participate in that. And I remember one year where they were working, they were working on spending, entitlement spending, discretionary spending, defense spending, non-defense spending. They couldn't balance the budget. And I said to the, the group, I said, it's about 50 people. I said, well, you know, revenues are ours, can be part of the solution. I'll never forget, Mr. Chairman, a lady in the back row raises her hand and she said, um, Congressman, I don't mind paying my fair share of taxes. I just want to make sure that everybody else is paying their fair share. I, I think that really sums it up very well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Carper. Uh, Senator Bennett is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate it, Ms. R and thank you all for your testimony today. Ms. Rollinson, I really have one thing that I want to focus on today, and uh, we've talked about it before. I appreciate the conversation we had a few months ago on, on our state tax refund issue that we've got in Colorado called TABOR. In Colorado, the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights Amendment, what we call TABOR, passed in 1992 to ensure that the state refunds excess tax revenue to taxpayers. And for over 30 years, so for decades and decades and decades, Coloradans have received these tax refunds and the IRS has not opined on whether they're subject to federal income taxes. So, um, but in February, the IRS announced, without any leadership, I think, at, at the IRS, in February, the IRS announced that it would, it would treat Tabor as federally taxable income throwing the tax season for Colorado f f filers into chaos and breaking with a longstanding precedent. I mean, we said to the IRS at the time, you're doing this, you're giving us this guidance now, 
right in the middle of tax filing season. It's the last possible minute when anybody in the state is going to be prepared to deal with an entirely new rule. So whatever one thinks about the, the ruling itself or the opinion itself, I think there is a question here about whether that's useful, uh, 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 a useful way for IRS, the agency, to approach these kind of questions, but I'll put that to one side for this moment. Last month, the IRS proposed a new policy that would tax some of these state and local refunds, overturning the 30-year precedent, I think, that, that the IRS had of treating this not as taxable income. I've had a conversation with Commissioner Werfel, at least one, maybe two, uh, with this, and we talked about this when we met a few months ago. I don't believe that anybody over at the IRS and in the office of the chief counsel has grappled, grappled with what this is going to mean for Colorado and maybe what the distinctions are between Colorado and other states that are, that are, that are, um, that are being affected by this. When I asked whether the chief counsel's office had previously reached out to the Colorado Department of Revenue to discuss the change that the IRS was proposing, the answer was no. We hadn't even talked to the people in the state to understand what their perception was of what was being done here. And I think the office has failed to recognize that the proposed policy is a major change from, from decades of precedent that's going to have a dramatic effect on Colorado taxpayers. And um, I hope that you'll agree that this isn't the right way to, to make these policy changes. Uh, and if confirmed, that we'll find a way to be able to work more effectively with states to give people notice and to have some understanding about what is happening. So I guess what I would just um, ask more than anything else on this particular issue, if, if you're confirmed, if you'd be willing to work with my office, with the Colorado delegation, with the Colorado Department of Revenue to ensure that the that the new guidance, uh, well, in, in my view, um, that the new guidance would not tax Tabor refunds. But if you do reach that conclusion at the end, that it's only after, you know, consultation with the folks that are going to be affected right with it. Yeah. And to the extent that you've got a substantive view of this, I'd be happy to hear that today. I'm just going to say you lose your Medicare card. Thank you. I know this is a very important issue to you and to all the people in Colorado. And yes, if confirmed, I would make it a priority to understand mm -hmm. what the thinking um, has been and also to work with, with your office and with the tax authorities in Colorado to make sure that the office of chief counsel really does understand what the payments are for. I will say that I, I think I had some suggestion from the IRS after the Thank you for that answer. I, I had a suggestion from the IRS after um, uh, the, the latest uh, iteration of this came out, suggesting that some changes that were made temporarily during COVID might have somehow led the IRS to reach the new conclusion that it did. And I would say, first of all, I don't understand that, but that's, that may be my fault, but I don't understand it. But I, but I, but I also think that that it seems to me that that doesn't necessarily obviate 30 years of practice between the state of Colorado or among the state of Colorado, our taxpayers, and the Internal Revenue Service. So I would hope that when you get there, we can get some attention on this and that we can get to a rational conclusion that makes sense for Colorado's taxpayers. Mr. Chairman, thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask I those thank questions. my colleague, Senator Blackburn, next. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much uh, for being before us today. I've got a couple of concerns I wanted to, rise, to raise with you because the issues seem to continue. One is the cybersecurity at the IRS and what is happening with data, what is happening with data breaches. Uh, there have been some pretty high profile data breaches, ProPublica and uh, the GAO has found numerous instances of willful misuse of, of information um, and unlawful, unauthorized access to information by employees. So um, hey, see you, pal. on this GAO report, have you seen that? And have you reviewed the deficiencies? And what are your thoughts? 
No, I have not seen the report. Okay. Will you do that and submit something in writing? Because to me, this should be intolerable. I, uh, I appreciate you raising this. I, I, I want a huge priority of the office to be, if I'm confirmed, is making sure the American public understands that the IRS is putting them first and is safeguarding their information. This is a very, very important issue. And if I'm confirmed, I look forward to getting See, I think it's astounding to people that they have to submit this information to the IRS. They're required to do this. And then they find out that there are these data breaches. And each one, it is like, why can't these people get this right? And we do hear a lot about it. Tennesseans are very concerned about that. And people need to know that their information is going to be private, that their name, their address, their social security number, their income, their tax filing is not going to be made public. So please, let's get some attention on that issue. Um, I want to talk with you about Commissioner Werfel. Uh, when he was here before us and I questioned him, we looked at that $400,000 threshold for audits on the American people. And he kind of waffled around a little bit on giving me an answer on exactly what that meant. Was that going to be net income? Was it going to be gross income? Because we've got a lot of Main Street small businesses that their gross is 400000 but what they make out of that, if they're a restaurant, if they're a retail shop, it might be, they might be taking home actually forty to 50000 And he used a term that was positive total positive income. Well, that meant the gross. So you've got, um, this is something that seems to be aimed squarely at the middle class and at the independent small business owner. So as you look at this and you say, nobody under $400,000 is going to have an audit, how do you calculate that? Are you looking at the net? Are you looking at the gross? Or are you going to use this new made-up term of total positive income? Yeah, thank you. I have, seen, I have seen the reports that the IRS will be going after the large partnerships, the high net wealth individuals, with, without the intention of auditing the, those with less than 400000 I, I if I'm confirmed, I look forward to understanding what, what they mean by their, that term. And I, I, share, I share your concern that it's something that the IRS needs to be transparent about so that everyone understands what is meant. Well, and the, um, when, they, when the administration did this, what were they talking about? They were talking about high earners. But now, just as we had predicted, it seems to be pointed squarely, squarely at the mom and pops and at the small businesses. Uh, so Tennesseans want to know where that is, where it's going to land. Is it your total taxable income? Is it going to be that gross? Uh, how are you going to address this because uh, they are really quite concerned about what they see as picking winners and losers at the IRS. They're concerned about people being targeted for their political or their religious positions, things that have happened in the recent past at the IRS. So we'll be watching that closely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank my colleague. Let me just kind of follow up real briefly on this point of the net positive income. I haven't talked to Mr. Werfel in the past. What I believe he's talking about is the example where a hedge fund manager can't offset their income with losses. But we'll continue this conversation. I look forward to it. And Mr. Chairman, uh, on that point, uh, he may have given you a different answer in a private conversation. That is not 
the response that he gave when we had the hearing. Therefore, you've got a lot of small business owners out there that are quite concerned about the ramifications of this position and the lack of clarity of, of exactly what he's going to do with that authority. Well, we'll continue this conversation. I'll, I'll only say I've heard him say in a number of instances that his version of approaches like net positive income is designed to make sure that the very wealthy can't game the system. But I, I get my colleague's point. I look forward to talking with her about it. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and congratulations to all the nominees and to your family and everyone who is here uh, to support you and maybe watching to support as well. Let me uh, start with um, uh, our public trustee nominees, Dr. Newman and it's Mr. Kazukas. Thank you. So uh, in Nevada, uh, there's over half a million uh, of Nevadans who re rely on Medicare to cover their health care needs. Uh, and there are uh, over half a, a million Nevadans that count on Social Security for their financial security. And, and clearly, the solvency of the Medicare and Social Security trust funds is crucial, not just for my state, but for the country. And in Congress, we have a responsibility to protect that solvency of these programs. Each year, we look to the trustees reporting for an accurate assessment of each fund's fiscal health. So let me ask both of you, and I'll start with Dr. Newman, how has your experience prepared you to represent the public interest in the oversight of these trust funds? Thank you for the question. Um, and I should say I'm so honored to even be considered for this position. I've spent my entire professional career working on Medicare and retirement income issues and thinking about how the programs serve the people who rely on them. And so as I approach this position, I approach it thinking of the people in Nevada and across the country who are relying on Medicare and Social Security to be there for them when they need it. I would approach this position well, um, as I approach my other work, which is I believe I bring analytic skills, um, I'm, I, our work is nonpartisan. I um, try to ask good questions in order to be sure. In this case, if I'm so fortunate to be um, confirmed, I would want to ask good questions. I would want to ch uh, check that the, that the assumptions of the, of the actuaries are sound and to think about what are the new trends that are happening and how is that going to affect the projections. What does it mean, what did COVID mean, for example, for disability? What does um, the advent of new drugs that may come along, such as Alzheimer's drugs, what could that mean for Medicare spending? So I would look to um, track what's going on with um, existing trends and keep an eye on things that are emerging in order to be sure that the work of the trustees and the report that comes to you is based on solid, information and analysis. Thank you. Senator, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, discuss my background and qualifications for the role. Uh, it's really a quite humbling role and one that's very meaningful to me, uh, both for personal and professional reasons. Uh, you know, I have uh, my, my first exposure to the to the programs was uh, in, in my own family history, like so many uh, Americans, and I appreciate the impact that they have on every American family. And so, uh, I think that just makes it all the more critical that Congress have the right information, a complete and objective picture about the financial and fiscal status of the programs. And, uh, and I would bring to the role a passion for these issues. I've dedicated my entire professional life to serving the populations that these programs serve, and I very much want to ensure that they continue to have access to the security and, uh, and, and care that uh, these programs provide. Uh, I've had the opportunity, uh, in fact, to work with uh, different parts of the agencies that uh, produce the reports. I served as secretary to the 2017 meeting uh, and uh, signed that report, so I have some familiarity with the process uh, firsthand. And I would look to bring these collective experiences to bear in this role if confirmed. Thank you. Um, and then, um, Ms. Rollinson. Um, I, I was grateful Senator Cornyn and I have worked together on legislation that we included in the Secure 2.0 retirement bill um, that was passed last year. That that allows domestic violence survivors to withdraw penalty-free from their retirement plans. 
but I, I think there's more that needs to be done um, with respect to helping uh, domestic violence survivors stay on that path. And I think the, the IRS can play an important role. So really what I'm looking for, and this is a conversation I've had with Commissioner Werfel, well, really just asking if you would commit to working uh, with the commissioner on this issue and reviewing where IRS policy mm -hmm. can be updated to help survivors of domestic violence. Thank you. That That's obviously a very Im important issue. And yes, I can commit to spending my time working on that issue. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, my time is up. Uh, I, uh, again, uh, congratulate you all on your nominations and thank you for your willingness to serve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank my colleague, Senator Cassidy. Uh, Mr. Kazukas and Ms. Newman, I'll focus my attention on you at first. Um, you both come from academic backgrounds. You both have a lot of experience with this. And I understand the role of the trustees is to kind of bring a different perspective to something which is otherwise kind of within the club, if you will. Now, for example, I understand that there's a controversy where the Social Security actuaries presume that um, replacement rate will be about two kids per family. Uh, CBO claims 1.75, and there's others that say it's actually closer to 1.65. And then we have the other influence of continued immigration, which kind of offsets. Um, now, that's going to make a huge difference. So uh, can you describe your approach as to you're coming into a group which kind of has a set perspective, and yet credible outside sources say maybe that perspective should be challenged. They may be right, maybe not. Um, how would you handle that? Ms. Newman. That's a good question. Thank you, Senator. And I appreciate your leadership on raising the visibility of issues and challenges facing Social Security, uh, because I do think these are very important issues. The work of the public trustees is very technical, and reviewing assumptions is extremely important, because any change in assumptions can have major ripple effects down the road. I think the role of the public trustee is to uh, bring fresh, a, a fresh set of eyes to the decisions that have been made, to bring in experts from outside to, to be... Now, I like what you're saying, but everybody wants to be liked. And as soon as you begin challenging assumptions of folks who have kind of settled on those assumptions, there's always a sense of perhaps being ostracized, et cetera. And so uh, I guess what I'm asking you, are y'all re re willing to at least challenge those assumptions, understanding you might be the fly in the ointment? Well, I like to think of myself as a straight shooter, and I understand that people might disagree, um, but I would certainly be comfortable raising questions and doing my best to, you know, if there's conflict, there's conflict, uh, but I'm not going to shy away from raising questions and confronting assumptions if I think they're wrong. Mr. Kazukas? I don't think I could uh, have said it any better myself. I agree wholeheartedly. With that, and I also add that my experience has been that uh, it's not necessary to always be perceived as a fly, that uh, sometimes this is about uh, people understanding that we're all working toward the same end. And I think that that's important uh, in carrying out a duty like this. And uh, so I would, uh, I would say that uh, my role here, if confirmed, would be to understand the perspective of the professionals who work on these issues uh, and what their viewpoint is to ask good questions like Dr. Newman said, and then ultimately uh, in the end uh, that suggests that perhaps uh, some, what's most important is some level of transparency about what, what assumptions are being made, how something like replacement ratio is being described and calculated in the report. And let me just interrupt because I have limited time, but echoing a little bit what Senator Crapo asked, which is how can you communicate with us? Frankly, you would have to educate us on the importance of these ripple effects. What may sound like a small detail, we understand makes a huge difference 10, 15, 20, and 70 years down the road. Mr. Kazukas, let me ask you this next question. Um, my staff confirmed to me, but the Medicare trustees effect often focuses on the HI fund, part A, and doesn't really pay a lot of attention to B and to uh, D. And yet there's some evidence that when, the Medi when, when George Bush passed the Part D program, that it had a positive effect in terms of reducing hospitalization. So there is a dynamic iterative effect. Uh, if, you, if you do something here, it actually benefits there. And in terms of the global budget, 
we know that has a big effect. So if you only focus on HI and you don't focus on the Part D program, my gosh, maybe we're spending a little bit less on, a little bit more on drugs, but we're saving a lot of money on hospitalization. You kind of miss an important story to tell. How would you handle that, sir? I think that, Senator, this is a, an example of how the trustees can contribute to the conversation. Uh, and while there's a lot of attention focused on the, the solvency dates and the like, and that, that's, those are really important things, what's also really important in the work of the trustees is the information and data they provide uh, around the program, the mechanics of the program, and, the and the why and how they make the calculations they make. And so the kinds of issues that you describe are things that the trustees uh, have uh, work around and, uh, and ex explain uh, the, you know, in, their, in their reports. And I would look forward to having the opportunity to uh, address these. Almost out of time. Ms. Newman, would you add anything to what he just said? No, I actually agree. And I think it, it is the role of the trustees to look at all parts of the program, A, B, C, and D, and look at the interactions. And I believe that's what they do. But I think what the public trustees can add to the conversation is making sure that um, the, the effects of, say, Part D, drugs on Part A, are clearly understood when the report is released. The report is long. It's got a lot of technical information, so it's sometimes hard to see what's what's embedded in the report. If the chair will indulge me, I'd also ask that you help us put that in the scope of the entire federal budget, because we're going to pay <laughs> for B and D separately from A. We may pay a little bit more here, but save a lot there. And if that's not delineated, we may not have that understanding. You've been indulgent, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I yield. Well, I, I just want to say to my colleague that I very much look forward to working with him on these issues. And we were talking with Ms. Newman, for example, about some of the other emerging trends, like chronic care, which came out of this committee. And apropos of your point with respect to Part D, I was one of the Democrats who voted for Part D, took an awful lot of flack for it. And I went looking, for example, at the effects of Part D on these other kinds of programs as you talk about. And we need that kind of information. So I want to thank my colleague for this approach of looking to these emerging trends. And I look forward particularly in terms of health care working closely with you. All right, Senator Hassan's next. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank you and uh, the ranking member for this hearing. And a thank you and congratulations to the panel on your nominations. Uh, the chief counsel role is vitally important to the fair and efficient administration of the IRS, and public trustees oversee the finances of both the Medicare and Social Security programs, so obviously very important to all Americans. The IRS chief counsel will be responsible for helping the agency modernize its IT systems, issue guidance for taxpayers, and generally help improve the customer service experience for taxpayers. So, Ms. Rollinson, I start with a couple of questions for you. The Inflation Reduction Act's investments in IT modernization will help better serve taxpayers as well as improve administration and implementation of our tax laws. I was really pleased to see that the IRS's strategic operating plan released earlier this year placed a particular emphasis on IT modernization. If confirmed, how will you, Ms. Rollison, leverage IT modernization efforts to provide a better customer service experience for the taxpayer? Thank you. Yeah, I, I was very interested and heartened to see that as well. And having been there five years ago, I yes, technology needed to be improved. Mm -hmm. I, if, if I'm lucky enough to be confirmed, I will be very interested to find out what they have been doing because I, I'm interested in the role that technology can have in helping assess what returns are, should possibly be audited. Because we know what the issues are, but how do we find them in the big par complex partnerships? How do we find those issues? And so that would be something I'd be very interested in learning more about. Well, and there are other ways that, of course, modernization can help the taxpayer experience for people who don't need to be audited yes. as well, correct? Absolutely. That's right. All right. Um, Last year, the Bipartisan Home Energy Savings Act that Senator Collins and I sponsored became law as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. It expanded tax cuts for families who make energy efficient home upgrades, such as purchasing a heat pump or upgrading their, uh, the insulation in their windows or doors. These tax cuts will help Granite Staters lower their energy bills. Ms. Rollinson, what recommendations do you have to help increase homeowners' use of the home energy improvement tax credits? 
Yes, it's a the the bill has many many interesting elements in it, and I know that Treasury has announced that they're through phase one of the guidance. If if I'm confirmed, I will want to make sure that the guidance is issued quickly so that taxpayers know what they need to do in order to claim the benefits that they are entitled to that will encourage them to make these improvements that you're discussing. Thank you. Um, one more question for you, Ms. Rollinson. Um, I want to draw your attention to an issue that some of my constituents have been dealing with. When the IRS sends out mail notifications, often it is to inform a taxpayer of an action that the taxpayer needs to take. Failure to respond can result in delayed refunds or problems for their small businesses, and sometimes there's a real disconnect between what the taxpayer says they've received and what the IRS has sent out. My office has dealt with dozens of these kinds of cases, and often there's been little leniency from the IRS, even when the taxpayer did nothing wrong. Sometimes they just didn't actually get the notice that the IRS says it sent. So how would you recommend improving the mail notification system so that taxpayers who don't receive notices are not improperly penalized? Thank you. That's a, a very thoughtful question. Um, and the mail is something that, that is near and dear to my heart. And I, and I, I do think that it is that the Office of Chief Counsel needs to work with the IRS to understand how to make sure notices received if they're not being received through the mail and certainly be understanding if there are in fact delays. Yeah, I, I would appreciate that because these um, cases are extraordinarily frustrating for taxpayers, but they often end up being assessed penalties that are really um, significant harm, harms for them. So I just would urge you to look at it. Um, and last question uh, to both of our public trustees. Thank you both for your willingness to serve. Public trustees play an essential role in providing unbiased expertise to ensure that the public understands Medicare's solvency and financial health. The trustees work to assess and project the financial health of the Medicare program creates an essential foundation for all of us as we do our policy making. I'm very concerned about trends that drive up health care prices for Medicare, including the increase in provider consolidation that New Hampshire and other states have seen over the last decade. We obviously need competition, but it's disappearing in the health care market with fewer and fewer independent providers uh, and fewer and fewer independent hospitals. Um, consolidation and payment incentives that drive consolidation have continued uh, contributed to a health care affordability crisis for older adults. So Dr. Newman and Mr. Kazukas, how will you incorporate your knowledge of consolidation trends in the health care market into your work as a public trustee? And I'll start with you, Dr. Newman. I am familiar with the issues that you're raising, and I think they're important issues. Looking at the effect of consolidation on healthcare prices is something that um, has been sort of well established in the literature. It has some effect on Medicare, but the, a larger effect is on commercial insurance, people with, with um, who pay private prices. I would um, hope and look forward to working with the trustees to understand what the effect is on healthcare trends. Uh, consolidation also, um, may have some impact on quality, and, and the evidence is a bit mixed on that. I think that's a little bit beyond the scope of the work of the public trustees, but I would want to look broadly at this issue, and thank you for raising it. Well, thank you. And Mr. Kazukas? I agree that the trustees are, are obligated to look at all the trends that uh, shape their projections and assumptions, and uh, consolidation can play a, a role in, in that as well. So I would look forward to working with the professional staff that uh, work on the report in the working group and the trustees to understand this issue and to uh, contribute to the dialogue around it as well as uh, the assumptions that they make. Thank you very much. Thanks for your indulgence, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hassan, for asking specifically about this consolidation issue. Uh, we now have something like 2 million people living in maternity deserts. And that's because these big systems, several of them, and we've faced this in Baker City, Oregon recently, are saying, hey, there aren't as many babies being born and we're just going to pick up and we're facing in Baker City a hospital that has been there for 120 years plus, basically saying we're not going to do it anymore. So I want everybody to know that what Senator Hassan is talking about, and we want you to confirm, this is a very 
powerful emerging trend. Two million Americans living in maternity deserts. And this has enormous ramifications for economic development in rural areas. I see Senator Daines here, my colleagues. This is going to be a major emerging challenge, and thank you for yeah. bringing it up. And Mr. Chair, I would just add, it contributes to things like maternity deserts. It also clearly is contributing to a, a, a increase in prices throughout systems. So, um, you know, I, I look forward to working with you on that. And thank you. And we very much support both of you, Democrat and Republican, but this is the kind of emerging trend we got to get on top of. Next is Mr. Senator Young. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I, I want to congratulate our witnesses. Thank you for being here today, and, and uh, I'm, I'm so appreciative that you wish to serve your country in the respective capacities uh, that you've been nominated. Ms. Rollinson, um, I have a few questions for you. I, I, you have uh, an impressive uh, and extensive background in the international tax area, so I suspect you um, are aware that the Treasury Department has received significant pushback as it pertains to uh, the administration's handling of OECD Pillar 2 negotiations, um, particularly provisions uh, like the undertaxed profits rule. Uh, this would uniquely disadvantage U.S. businesses. It would allow foreign countries to actually tax the U.S. activity of U.S. companies. I almost I have to read that again. It would allow foreign countries to tax the U.S. activity of U.S. companies. So can you please share your views on the current uh, Pillar 2 negotiations? Uh, thank you for your question. Yes, I have, I have seen that. Uh, when I was at the Office of Chief Counsel up until 2019, they were just in the very beginning phases of looking at Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Um, the Office of Chief Counsel actually has a very small role to play in this. This is, this is negotiations that, as you mentioned, are done by Treasury. We certainly have some people that would consult on what the current state of the U.S. law was. Right. But um, the Office of Chief Counsel does not have a very strong role in those, the negotiations that you're talking about. You would, uh, you're nominated to uh, be chief counsel of the IRS and, as I understand it, uh, assistant general counsel of, tr of Treasury, right. right? So more broadly, that it's a broader portfolio than, than just the chief counsel uh, position, as I understand it. So um, if you could just volunteer to me in light of that, uh, how, how you anticipate Pillar 2 impacting U.S. companies. So I... I, I, it's a very important question, and I'm, I'm worried that I'm not going to be giving a very satisfactory answer. I, I understand the motivation for Pillar 2. because I know you can give a thoughtful answer because of your extensive experience as an <laughs> international tax attorney. There you go. So, which you did not challenge. I did not challenge <laughs> that. Yes, that you're absolutely, you got me. The, um, what I can say is this, that the... I understand why Pillar 2 evolved. And the reason I say that is what I did not do much of in international tax, uh, but is critically important, is look at transfer pricing issues. And I don't mean to get technical, but there have been so many disputes in the U.S. and abroad. Let's not get technical, because I... The, the term transfer pricing, I start to glaze, glaze over. Let's, let's just get real foundational. Let's go back to, do you agree that the undertax profits rule would disadvantage U.S. businesses by allowing foreign countries to tax the U.S. activity of U.S. companies? I have to say, if you disagree with that, um, I may find it challenging to support your nomination, because for me it's so obvious, unless you provide me a very compelling reason why you disagree. Thank you. Uh, this is not going to be compelling to you. However, uh, the rule that you mentioned is actually one that I would need to get much more information about. It is, it is not one that I followed carefully when, once I left, and it was not there when I, when I left. So it is something I would need to get a lot more information about before I would have 
a view as to whether it is disadvantaging companies. Okay. Well, kindly follow up with me uh, and the committee so that everyone has an opportunity to review your response. I've received a lot of these written responses. I'll say this on the record. And it is amazing how your support staff uh, will provide a very vague and diplomatic response uh, to, we know how that works. Um, Ms. Rollinson, um, in light, once again, of your extensive international tax experience, um, you're no doubt aware that I and, and many of my colleagues have been particularly critical of the administration's failure to uh, secure favorable treatment of important non-refundable tax credits, such as the R&D credit, under the proposed Pillar 2 regime. Um, based on your experience as an international tax professional, do you anticipate the current Pillar 2 model rules will act as a disincentive for companies looking to make investments in R&D activities in the United States? Thank you. I, um, again, I, I would need to know a lot more about how it operates right now before I could answer that. Okay, I'll answer. Okay. This will be a disincentive to uh, U.S. companies investing in R&D in the United States at the time that China is offering very generous incentives for research and, and development to companies that locate there. Thank you. My so colleagues much. and members on both sides know that I strongly support reauthorizing the R&D program. Senator Daines. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm glad we're having this hearing. As this position has been vacant for over two years, leaving the IRS without their top legal advisor. In that time, the IRS has caused direct harm to taxpayers on numerous occasions with little to no justification. Let me speak to a couple of these instances. During the early years of the Biden administration, June of 2021, ProPublica leaked a staggering amount of private taxpayer information. This information was legally protected. It was confidential IRS data, yet to this day, the IRS has failed to find and hold someone accountable. Despite the Government Accountability Office underscoring the need to resolve these immediate security weaknesses, the IRS has continued to mishandle private taxpayer information. Just last week, my Republican colleagues on this committee, including myself, sent a letter seeking answers regarding the destruction of millions of unprocessed taxpayer information returns. On June 14th of 2023, heavily armed, in fact, 20 heavily armed IRS agents entered the Highwood Creek Outfitter store in Great Falls, Montana, and seized boxes of ATF Forms 4473. Let me say that again. 20 heavily armed IRS agents entered a business, Highwood Creek Outfitters, and seized ATF Forms 4473. It's unclear how these forms pertain to the IRS, as they are not a financial document but rather the background check, the form that contains personal information on gun purchasers. I filled out many of those forms in firearms I've legally purchased in Montana. Following inquiries from myself and my colleagues, I'm glad to have finally received a response announcing the end of these egregious in-person taxpayer visits. However, as we've seen, the IRS has a lengthy history of abusing their power and depriving taxpayers of their rights in such instances cannot occur again. Ms. Rollinson, underneath your leadership, what steps would you take to ensure taxpayer information is protected and to put an end to these intimidation practices? Thank you, Senator. You really raise a very important issue of public trust. And it, 
I find it very disturbing to see how the public trust in the IRS has eroded. To me, that is a very critical issue to take on right away. All the issues you raised really go to that point. And so I would be hopeful that if I'm confirmed that under my leadership, we could work to restore the trust by ensuring that we are working closely with Congress and their very important oversight role to make sure that Congress gets the information that it needs, that we are reporting to the right people, as I think happened in the ProPublica leak, that, that something has gone wrong and do what we can to fix it, and that we make sure that the that Congress, that we're working with Congress in a way that Congress trust in the IRS is restored and that together we can have the American public's trust restored in the IRS. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I mean, I was getting calls from a lot of Montanans, too. We, we talked to the ProPublica League, thank you, but what happened in Great Falls to have 20 armed IRS agents move into a business like that and seize, seize the uh, ATF forms, it, I mean, it was chilling to see what was happening you know, to a business there in Montana. And uh, uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot of damage done here and a breach of trust, whether it's leaks of a ProPublica or in this case, a proactive, um, premeditated raid with 20 IRS agents armed uh, to seize ATF forms. Yeah, I, I understand. I, I, we absolutely need to make sure that the IRS is always operating in a fair manner and treating taxpayers fairly. I, I agree with you. Um, lastly, and I know I'm, I'm running out of time, but I was discouraged to see the plan that Commissioner Warfel revealed earlier this year outlining how he plans on using the $80 billion allocated to the IRS from the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, the 87,000 agents that have been hired to increase audits, on Montanans and targeting everyday Americans. While the administration may claim they're not going to increase taxes anybody under $400,000, their actions say otherwise. If the army of these new IRS agents wasn't proof enough, just last week, the IRS announced their newest effort to knock on taxpayers' doors. This unit is specifically focused on targeting pass-through entities, be LLCs and S-Corps, which make up over 95% of all businesses and employ about 50% of American workers. These actions show the IRS isn't going after wealthy tax cheats, they're going after Main Street businesses. Meanwhile, my office hears from constituents every day that they're trying to reach the IRS, and at best, they're on hold listening to mediocre 70s music, on hold for hours before reaching an agent, and at worst, not able to make any contact at all. Uh, given your extensive management experience, Ms. Rawlinson, do you think it makes sense to prioritize spending billions of dollars on Main Street businesses instead of investing in customer service efforts at the IRS? I, I do agree that, that the IRS should be focusing on improving customer service. I think that will go a long way to improving the trust that the American public has in the IRS. I, I think that's critically important. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I thank my colleague. I only want to say with respect to uh, what's really going on out there in uh, the tax area reflects uh, what I did today, releasing data that shows that there are thousands of millionaires who simply refuse to file or pay their taxes. And that's what the new money at the IRS has got to focus on. Just get your arms around that. That's not what people normally think, that the billionaire or the millionaire calls up their tax accountants and tries to work out <clears throat> some sort of way to not take income or pay payroll taxes. We're talking about here non-filing, thousands of millionaires in the data that I released today just for three years from the IRS simply basically gave a raspberry you know, to the government, you know, just said, we're not going to file. We're not going to pay. And that's wrong. And that's what we've got to focus on the IRS. Senator Menendez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just for the record, not all 70s music is that bad. So uh, congratulations to all of the nominees. Dr. Newman and Mr. Kazukas, uh, my office has heard from constituents who rely on Social Security and Social Security disability payments and have received letters demanding uh, money back for overpayments made by the agency. According to recent reports, critically low staffing levels mean it could be several years 
before the Social Security Administration can reassess cases and catch overpayments. Some individuals are even receiving bills from the Social Security Administration that date back 40 years. In your view, how much of this is caused by chronic understaffing at the Social Security Administration? Senator, uh, thank you for the question. I think that this uh, highlights uh, the, perhaps uh, the distinction between the role of the trustees and uh, the folks who run the Social Security program. Uh, obviously, Dr. Newman and I, if confirmed, would have uh, the privilege of serving with those uh, folks and that leadership, uh, and our role would be to assess the financial and fiscal future of the program, to provide data and information to this Congress and the public about the disability insurance program in terms of its uh, f financial status and the like. Uh, so I think that the, the kinds of questions you're perhaps getting at uh, relate to the administration of the program day to day, which uh, yeah. we wouldn't be involved in. Well, except that in terms of its fiscal integrity, if we are talking about four decades that people are getting notices, if we are thinking about the rate in which there may be overpayments, uh, and of course, uh, even though you're looking at fiscal integrity, I, I would assume that you also want the program to work well as it relates to the well-being of the beneficiaries. Uh, this, is, this is an issue because if we're talking about uh, millions of dollars, it goes to the fiscal integrity. Wouldn't you agree? I can see the connection yeah, as part of a larger, broader picture mm -hmm. of the way that the finances roll up to the program, sir. Let me ask you this, uh, both of you. According to the Social Security Administration Inspector General, during fiscal year 2022, the agency, and this goes to fiscal integrity, clawed back $4.7 billion of overpayments, while another $21.6 billion remained outstanding. According to recent reports, those who receive Social Security payments say they've gotten letters saying they must give back thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars to the government because of overpayment. Uh, what else would you be looking for to have fiscal integrity here to make sure that we're not talking about billions of dollars, assuming that the administration is right and these are overpayments? Obviously, to some degree, there has to be a universe of it that is, but it's a very significant number. I would just add that I'm, I, I totally agree with uh, Mr. Kazukas uh, in his response to your question, uh, but I've also read these articles that I think you're referring to, and I understand how this is such a serious issue for families who were suddenly asked to repay large amounts of money that they didn't know that they owed. Uh, I really think, however, that this is more a question for, say, the Social Security Administrator um, because our role would be more to look at what are the effects on disability spending trends and obligations to the disability trust fund. But the broader issue is I think this is a, is, has a profound impact and is very scary for families when they get these letters. No, it's usually scary for them. Uh, but it also goes to the integrity of the system. If billions of dollars are being paid out, that in fact should not have been paid out, uh, then I do think that as trustees, you'd be looking at that as something of concern. Is, is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think that is a fair statement and it is something that I would look forward to discussing with the actuaries and the public, uh, the other trustees if I'm fortunate to be confirmed. Mr. Kazukas? I would as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think with that, I'm satisfied uh, with the questions I want to ask you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're moving to wrap up. We've got a couple of procedural things. I have one last uh, uh, question. Without objection, I'd like to enter into the record statements of support from Ms. Rollins, from former bipartisan Treasury and IRS officials, including the Chief Counsel and Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy under President uh, Trump. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, members today for their participation. And uh, with respect to questions for the record, the deadline for members to submit uh, QFRs will be next Tuesday, October 3rd at 5 p.m. The deadline is firm. We uh, appreciate uh, the cooperation of everyone. Here's what is going to happen uh, now. I want to make one last point, and then I am going to uh, hand uh, matters over to the senator from Massachusetts 
who will ask her questions, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Senator Warren, uh, what, one of the areas that I've been particularly concerned about is what the shutdown is going to do to seniors and veterans and small business people in terms of interruptions. And let me tell you what I've picked up according to the news in the last you know, hour. If you're for shutting down the government, you are sending a message to America's seniors. For example, you better not lose your Medicare card because they aren't going to be able to get replacements. So this idea that it's some kind of just Washington, you know, ritual or, or, or something, that's what it really means. And if you're for shutting down the government, explain it to seniors because a lot of folks, you know, uh, those uh, Medicare cards can get, get lost and seniors aren't going to get a replacement. Senator Warren, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the IRS makes a lot of decisions that profoundly affect who actually pays to support our government. And it's why I am very concerned about the revolving door, where large accounting firms send their lawyers into high-ranking positions at the IRS to create new tax loopholes for their clients, and then those firms reward those same lawyers with promotions and bigger paychecks when they leave government service and come back to the accounting firm. Now, Ms. Rawlinson, you have been through the revolving door more than once. You've gone from Ernst & Young to the IRS and then from the IRS back to Ernst & Young and once again from Ernst & Young back to the IRS, this time as chief counsel. I think that's a red flag, but you've made an unprecedented commitment as a nominee. Ms. Rawlinson, you have sent me a letter committing, among other things, to recuse yourself from any matters related to former clients for your first four years at the agency and for four years after you leave the IRS not to go to work for any company, including Ernst & Young, that has clients you interact with while you are at the IRS. This goes even further than President Biden's strong ethics requirements. Do I have that right? Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> Thank you. I'd like to enter into the hearing record Ms. Rawlinson's letter making those commitments. Um, Ms. Rawlinson, I appreciate your taking these steps to assure that the public, to assure the public that you will put their interests first and I support your nomination. Um, hearing no objection, I entered it into the record. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kazukas. You have been nominated to serve as the public trustee of the Medicare and Social Security Trust Funds. I have concerns about your conflicts of interest. Now, this shouldn't be a surprise. I sent you a letter outlining those concerns. And, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make that letter part of the hearing record so ordered. The position of public trustee was created in the 1980s to give the public a voice in the Board of Trustees' solvency projections for Medicare and Social Security. And a big factor influencing Medicare solvency today is the growth of Medicare Advantage, a program that allows for profit insurance companies to sell Medicare coverage that experts say is on target this year to charge, overcharge the government by $75 billion. In other words, Medicare Advantage has a lot to do with threatening the solvency of Medicare. Mr. Kazukas, you sit on the board of Clover Health, a for-profit insurance company that, according to its most recent SEC filing, receives a, quote, substantial portion, close quote, of its total revenue from Medicare Advantage premiums. How much are you paid for your work at Clover? Senator, I'm uh, paid in accordance with the company's uh, process for... Okay, and what's the dollar amount? That's what I'm asking. Uh, well, there's a uh, portion of the competition that relates to equity and a portion that relates to particular roles on the board. So you don't know the amount that you're getting paid from Clover? Then how about you tell me? Well, it, it, uh, there's a portion that relates to the... Could I have a dollar amount, please? 
Well, it, it also depends on the, uh, on the, the year and the time. Uh, it, okay, you did a financial disclosure last year. Would you like to tell me what you said on your financial disclosure, which you signed under oath? I believe, Senator, as laid out in your letter, you uh, pointed out to uh, the payment that was from Clover for, with regards to 2022 and the compensation therein uh, being in the category of uh, $100,000. Okay, so you received $100,000 from Clover for your service. And if confirmed as a public trustee, do you plan to quit the Clover board? Senator, I appreciate the opportunity to address your question. The role uh, it's, it's really easy. You can say yes or you can say no. Senator, the role of the trustees of the Social Security... Is that a Medicare. yes or a no? Do you plan to quit the job for which you were paid $100,000 a year? Senator, I'm grateful to the president and his team for the review of my credentials and qualifications. I mean, really? As well. You know you're going to have to answer this question. Is it yes or no? Are you planning to resign the job that pays you $100,000 a year while you are uh, a trustee for Medicare? Senator, the review of, uh, the, of my current activities and my credentials and qualifications uh, is one that all under nominees undergo. And that's one that led to the president putting my nomination before this body. I'm grateful for that. And if given Look, the I'm not going to get into why the president nominated you. What I want to know is, are you going to keep a job where you get paid by a for-profit outfit somewhere in the neighborhood of $100,000 a year while you keep your government trustee job. Can you answer that question? Senator, the role of the trustees actually... Okay, I'm going to take that as a yes, because I'm going to assume that if you were going to quit that job, you would be really happy to tell me that right now before we go into the question of what it means for you to keep this job. Mr. Kazukas, as we both know, as a member of the board, corporate law requires you to help Clover maximize its profits. So, for example, if you highlighted the amount of fraud that Medicare Advantage uh, undergoes every year and how that fraud is undermining the solvency of Medicare, that could lead to policies that might limit the Medicare Advantage program. And if that happened, Mr. Kazukas, would limiting the Medicare Advantage program undercut the profitability of Clover, the company that, by law, you are supposed to be watching out for? That was a question. I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question. Or, or got, so, uh, uh, all right. Question so, so my question is, you are, if you are on the board of Clover, you are legally obligated to try to help Clover to improve its profitability over time, or at least sustain its profits. That's corporate law, 101, right? So if you are also serving as a Medicare trustee, I just want to be clear here. If the focus in the Medicare program is on the amount of fraud that is currently in the Medicare Advantage program, I think it's reasonable to assume that could lead to, under, uh, to reducing the amount of money that we put into Medicare Advantage, to putting more restrictions on Medicare Advantage, to saying we've got to put a cop on the beat, maybe cut it out altogether. What I'm asking you is would that injure Clover? That is, would it reduce Clover's profitability? Senator, I think uh, all Americans, uh, and I especially, would, would share your attentiveness to the questions of fraud. Uh, I, I appreciate that, that, but I asked you a pretty straightforward question. That if you're actually going to be a trustee on behalf of the American people and people who care about the solvency of Medicare, then I think you ought to be able to answer it. If Medicare currently, as it stands, put more restrictions on Medicare Advantage, would that likely cut into the profitability of Clover, the company from which you receive more than $100,000 in compensation annually? Senator, I think that the question you're asking... I know the question I'm asking. Could you answer my question, please? Yes. You want to be a trustee for the American people. You ought to be able to answer that question. The, the question you're asking is one that deserves a, a greater context about the role of the trustee. No, it deserves an answer. 
from you. You want to be the trustee, then answer the question. If Medicare cut what goes into Medicare Advantage, would that hurt Clover's profitability? That's not a hard question. And in fact, Clover has already pretty much answered that in a, its public documents. So could you give an answer to that, please? I, I think, Senator, that uh, what's important to focus here on here. I know what's important to focus on here. That's why I'm here, is to ask the questions that are important to focus on. Could you answer my question, please? Yes, Senator. I think that uh, if, if confirmed, uh, Dr. Newman and I would be an outside set of eyes and ears. That is not my question. Can you answer my question, or are you just flatly refusing? Senator, I... Be delighted to to discuss. Then answer my question. And I think that the, the question is one that that is in the context of a hearing. No, it's a question that's a straight financial question. You know, Mr. Kazukas, I think you think you're going to get away from, with this by just not answering the question and not having any clip that admits how much money you're taking from a private insurance company that makes its money through Medicare Advantage at the same moment that you're trying to take a public role that will influence whether we focus on the fraud in Medicare Advantage or whether we turn a blind eye to it. Let's be clear. If Mr. Kazukas ignores the fraud, then he helps Clover. If he focuses on the fraud, he hurts Clover. The conflict of interest here is so big and so pervasive that there is no action that Mr. Kazukas can take that doesn't either help or hurt Clover, the company that pays him $100,000 a year to sit on its board and watch out for the company. And there is no waiver that can change that fact. This kind of conflict is shocking, and it is deeply unethical. Not a single other trustee has ever received compensation from an insurance company while acting as a Medicare trustee. And if you won't step down from the Clover board, then you should withdraw your nomination. And if you do not withdraw, given the clear conflicts posed by your board service, I will strongly oppose your nomination, and I will encourage every other senator in this body to do so as well. I am through. Uh, and they want me to gavel out when you're done. So I don't have a gavel, but this hearing is now closed. Thank you.